Now we're coming to the third fruit of a reckless life or a spiritual life. King was not that satisfied with the first two answers, so he asks again. And so the Buddha says, yes, listen carefully. And King Ayatasattu says, yes, you will listen. So the Buddha says, herein, great king, a Tathagata arises in the world, a worthy one, perfectly enlightened, endowed with clear knowledge and conduct, accomplished a knower of the world, unsurpassed trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and men, enlightened and exalted. Having realized by his own direct knowledge this world with its gods, its maras and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its rulers and people, he makes it known to others. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. Possessing meaning and phrasing, he reveals the holy life that is fully complete and purified. So here, the third fruit is dependent upon the fact that there is a Buddha there. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the Buddha has to be physically available, but his teaching has to be available. Because the Buddha said, who sees me, sees the Dhamma. Who sees the Dhamma, sees me. So it is the teaching which is the most important aspect of this whole dispensation. The Buddha considered himself just the mouthpiece. In fact, he called himself a shower of the way. That's all. He's just showing the way. And the first few lines, you may have recognized them. They are the chant that we're chanting in the morning. A few words are a little different, but they are the qualities of the Buddha. Now the reason we chant them is that we know the qualities and have a guideline that we ourselves may be able to follow in those footsteps, not the qualities which are particularly belonging to a Buddha, because a Buddha is a person becomes enlightened by finding the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path by himself. The other people become enlightened, Arahants, by following that path. They don't have to find it themselves. So a Buddha is a very special person. And Buddha is not a name, it means the enlightened one. So that makes the Buddha's quality is something special. But endowed with clear knowledge and conduct, which is moral conduct and inside wisdom, is something we can aspire to. Perfectly enlightened, accomplished, a knower of the world. A person who's enlightened knows the world. There's nothing any more hidden then, because the mind is totally enlightened. There's no darkness in it left. But an unsurpassed trainer of men to be tamed and teacher of gods and men, that is something particular and peculiar to a Buddha. And having realized by his own direct knowledge, this world, with its gods, its maras and its brahmas, own direct knowledge that depicts a Buddha who has done it by himself. But the word direct knowledge is very important. Direct knowledge is not just information. It's not just knowing. Direct knowledge is the understood experience. This is what I am mentioning many times. If we don't know, we won't understand the experience. And this happens many, many times 
to many, many meditators that they do have an experience, but they don't understand it because they don't have any knowledge about it. So both is necessary, the experience and the understanding, which is direct knowledge is just another way of saying the same thing, the understood experience. So the world with its gods, its maras, its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its rulers and people, he makes it known to others. In other words, the Buddha is always a teacher. An enlightened one who is not a teacher is, arahants are often not teachers, but an enlightened, there are also Buddhas who have not become teachers and they are called Pacheka Buddhas. So one who is called the Buddha is always a teacher. And it's always um, quite interesting. We'll hear about that in a minute, how it comes to it. So what it says is that he knows about everything. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, possessing meaning and craving. This is something I've been mentioning several times already. We cannot pick out of the teaching what we would like. Most people would like to have a little bit of peace in their minds. And they would also maybe know how to love everybody. And that, that will do it. But that's not the Buddha's dispensation. If we get involved with the Buddha's teaching, it's good in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. It's the whole lot. In fact, in the Buddha's teaching, it's all or nothing. Because the whole thing leads somewhere. And if we don't keep it going, Buddha said, if we don't advance, we go backwards. There is no standing still. So if we would like to pick out those bits and pieces which we think are very applicable to our daily lives, we won't succeed. It's not possible. We have to get the whole thing and then use it in our daily lives. Use all of it, whatever it is that we have been able to accomplish. But not the selective. The selection is a natural one anyway, because we can only practice that which we understand and are able to do. So those things are a natural selection. But if we then have a judgmental selection, namely that what I like and what I don't like, what I'd like to think is easy and I'll do it, and which is difficult and I won't do it, that does not succeed. Because we need the whole thing in order to change our whole inner being. We're not only going to be able to change one little bit of us, we have to change the whole lot. Possessing meaning and phrasing. The, um, the phrasing is the, the verbalization, the articulation, and the Buddha was particularly capable of that. He was particularly capable of articulating precisely, and he made that also a point of Dhamma learning and teaching to be precise, which is the phrasing. But there is the meaning behind it. So in other words, we cannot just use the words. If we just use words out of the teaching or for our own experiences, we're going to be very superficial and it's not going to amount to anything. The meaning has to be understood. And this is the reason why I'm taking a sutta and explaining it. Because otherwise I could hand you a copy of this there's a photostat machine in this uh, office here. I could easily hand you a copy of this and say, here, there you are. But that won't do. The phrasing is there, but the meaning has to be with it. And the meaning has to be understood from a personal connection and a feeling of what these phrases actually mean. It's important. So he reveals the holy life that is fully complete and purified. Now the holy life or the spiritual life, either way, it doesn't matter, makes no difference. Um, that is fully purified and fully uh, purified and fully complete. 
we consider that always in the context of containing those three aspects of the teaching, which is the moral conduct, the concentration, and the insight. And it's often depicted the uh, holy life, the complete and purified holy life, as containing, first of all, the precepts, however many one wants to take. And secondly, then, the practice of the four supreme emotions, loving kindness, compassion, joy with others, and equanimity. And with that as a starting point, then the other things are added on to it, the concentration and the insight. So this is what is usually understood to be the beginning of that. Now, when it says a knower of the world, it's usually meant that there are three kinds of world. There's the physical world, which we can all see. It's our bodies and all the other bodies which are everywhere to be found. And we then have the human world, the one we are mostly concerned with. This is the one which doesn't have all the other aspects of physicality in it or corporality. I mean, there's plenty of uh, physical manifestation everywhere, but we are mostly at loggerheads with the human world. That's where our most com difficulties come from. And then there is the world of formations, and that is the mental formations. And the mental formations, so we have the physical, we have the human, we have the mental formations. And the mental formations that are meant here, when it says that, are that which goes beyond the human world because there are 32 kinds of, or 32 realms of existence. We'll come to that in a minute. But it says, when a Tathagata arises in the world of beings, he does not arise in the world of gods or in the Brahma world, but only in the human world. He does not arise in other world systems within the human world, but only in this one. So all Buddhas, and this one that we learn from is the seventh, in this tradition, there are 24 in another tradition, but this one is seven. They all arise in the human world as a human being, such as we are. With, of course, long years of practice behind them. In this case, 500 lifetimes are told that he has been practicing. That's not terribly long, because one lifetime is usually very short. Now this is first of all an extremely hopeful situation, because if the Buddha himself was a human being, all of us certainly have the potential for enlightenment as human beings. And the other thing which is mentioned is that from the time he formed the aspiration for Buddhahood at the feet of the Buddha Dipankara, up to the time he reached the path of Arahantship, he is said to have been arising. And with the attainment of the fruit of Arahantship, he is said to have arisen. This is 500 lifetimes ago. There was a Buddha Dipankara. And our Buddha, the Buddha that we learn from, Siddhartha Gautama, which was his name before he became a Buddha, was then called the Sage Samedo. And he met this Buddha Dipankara. And at the feet of the Buddha Dipankara, he made the resolution. He wanted to become the next Buddha. And so he worked for five hundred lifetimes. That resolution is so strong that it stays with the mind through 
birth and rebirth. Now this totally refutes meditative ideas, I'm just going to let it happen. It won't. Guaranteed. One's got to make a resolution, a determination to be concentrated, to change one's mind, to have only the wholesome and not the unwholesome. One must have a resolution to stay on the breath, to go from one of the jhanas to the next, Everything has to be done with determination. Now that is not the same as an achievement syndrome. That is nothing but a goal which one has to work for. And if one doesn't have a goal to work for, the mind plays tricks. It plays its usual games of doing what it likes, going all over the place. If one doesn't have a goal in life, which is really worthwhile working for and what could be more worthwhile than becoming enlightened, then the mind loses impetus. Nothing is easier for a mind than to fall into torpor. A mind that just says, ah, oh, well, you know, do it later, not so important, and just allow anything to happen and that is the mind we know the mind we know we allow our minds usually anything whatever it is wholesome unwholesome negative positive uh, nonsense fantasy whatever it is we allow it now we have to have that kind of resolution that is necessary for meditation but also in daily living and that kind of resolution means self-discipline in the mind. And if there's no self-discipline in the mind, it goes berserk. It is the easiest thing to go berserk, because that's what happens in the world all the time. All we have to do is listen to all these uh, police the cars. Somebody's gone berserk with something. It happens every minute somewhere on this planet. So the resolution that the Buddha made at the feet of the Buddha Dipankara when he was the sage tomato, he was called sage tomato, um, shows us quite clearly, without such a thing, there's no path. There is potluck, but that's not really good enough. Sage tomato also, the story says, that he had very long hair. He was one of these uh, wanderers and uh, had a very long hair. And it was pouring rain. And uh, the same story that we have in, uh, in the English history. And he put his hair down so that the Buddha could walk uh, dry over these puddles. And uh, after he had done that, then he had that resolution to become the next Buddha. From the time the Tathagata was offered the meal of honey and milk rice by Sujata on the eve of his enlightenment up to the time he reached the path of Arahatship, he is said to have been arising, and with the attainment he has arisen. First the word Tathagata. The Tathagata means one gone such. Gata is gone, and uh, Tata is such, suchness. And the Buddha sometimes talks about himself in the third person and then he calls himself the Tathagata. That word is only used for a Buddha. And uh, he often also talks about himself in the first person. It doesn't have to be in the third person. But then that word is used. One gun such, suchness. I have um, briefly told the story of Sujata in the other course, but I'll tell it now. It's a very nice story, and it is mentioned here, so in the sort of in passing, because everybody knows it. When the Buddha had not become enlightened yet, but was a Bodhisattva, he made up his mind that he was going to sit under this certain tree, which he found to be conducive to solitude and 
meditate long enough to gain enlightenment even if it meant that his flesh would rot from the bone. And he found this tree in what is today Bodh Gaya and uh, he sat down under it. Behind the tree was a river. It's now a dry riverbed. And the tree has also no longer the original tree, but what is growing there now and the same spot is a sapling of a sapling of the original tree. So he said there, now this tree was famous in the area that if women would pray to the deva living in that tree that to have um, a child, this deva could help them if they had had difficulty conceiving a child. That was his tree was famous for that. So there was a woman living in that area. Her name was Sujata and she had, had been waiting for a baby for many, many years and finally she decided to go to that tree, pray to the deva living in the tree and if a child would be born, she promised that she would make a great offering to the deva. And nine months later she did have a child. But she was a very busy lady and had a, she had a large um, dairy farm. So she hadn't got around making her offering yet. So one day her maid went by that tree and saw what she thought was the deva sitting under the tree. It was actually, of course, the Buddha, but she thought it was the deva from that tree. And so she said to this supposed deva, uh, please, sir, don't go away. My mistress will make the offering for sure. So since the Buddha had no intention of going anywhere, he just sat there. And so this maid ran home to the mistress and said, you know that deva, she's is sitting under the tree and waiting for your offering. So Sujata said, all right, we'll do that right away. And so the story says, she milked a hundred cows and gave the milk to drink to fifty cows. And then she milked the fifty cows and gave the milk to drink to 20 cows. Then she milked the 20 cows and gave the milk to drink to one cow. And when she milked the last cow, pure cream came out. And then she cooked rice in that cream. And then, according to this, she added honey to it. And then she put that whole um, meal into a golden bowl. This is called in Singhalese Kiri Bhat and uh, Kiri is milk and Bhat is rice, milk rice, which is also a very well known um, German dish. I suppose my mom eats it here too. <laughs> yes, it's well known. And in Sri Lanka, there is no single holiday or festival that monks and nuns are not offered Kiri Bhat. It's a sign for being a festival. So she took this milk rice and the golden bowl and offered this to the Bodhisattva. And he accepted it. And he ate the rice. And then he took the golden bowl and he said, I will throw this in the river behind me. And if the bowl will swim downstream with the current, I will not get enlightened. If it will swim upstream against the current, I will be enlightened. So obviously it must have swum upstream. Mm -hmm. But the moral of the story is of significance for us. If we go downstream with the current of public opinion, if we go with society's ways of dealing with things, if we go downstream with the world, also with our own instincts and impulses, we will have quite an easy passage. Everybody goes in the same direction. But where do we end up? In the mud flats. That's where most streams, all streams end. Should we try? 
to go against our own instincts and impulses, against the current, against that, what the world does, go to the beach, in other words, instead of meditating, and watch television instead of learning the Buddha's words. If we should go against all that, it's much more difficult, because to go against the current needs far more strength and energy. And the whole of the other society will be going in the other directions and probably calling to us and saying, what are you doing? You're going the wrong way. How come you're going upstream? Everybody else is going downstream. But if we persist and persevere and actually go all the way, we come to the source to the pure and undiluted spring where the stream had its beginning. Naturally, it's much more difficult. And this is the story which is the meaning behind this well-known fable. Every child in Theravadan Buddhist countries knows the story of Sujata. Very, very few, if any, know that this is what is meant. It never looked behind the fable. This is what happens when you get imbued with those things, you don't investigate them. Practicing Dhamma, understanding it, is 180 degrees turned around from what the world does. And that has to become an understanding in our minds because if we don't, we can't practice properly. We'll always sample it. As if we were to stick our big toe in a swimming pool to see what the temperature is. But we never jump in to really find out. So going upstream is more difficult, and that's the story of Sujata, one of the most famous stories of the Buddha's lifetime. The direct cognition, which is meant with the direct knowledge, is what we experience any time that we have an insight. Direct cognition. The direct cognition which shows us quite clearly that things are different from the way they thought we were. They, we thought they were. <laughs> because we have experienced all of this before. We have thought and felt and acted and spoken millions of times. But once we see it differently, we have a direct cognition. So the Buddha says about the great benefit of a Tathagata in the world who makes the teaching known to others. Now about making the teaching known to others, When the Buddha was enlightened under this Bodhi tree, he sat in the bliss of Nibbana for a week, and then he pondered whether he should teach. And he first decided not to, because he felt that his teaching was much too profound and much too different from anything that was being taught so that people would not understand him. The story said, says about his life that the highest Brahma, the highest God, came to visit him and begged him to teach for the sake of gods and men. One should understand this, that that happened within him. And so then it says that he took another look around at the world around him and he saw that there were some being some humans with little dust in their eyes that they could understand his teaching and for them he started teaching. So it was first a reluctance, not because there was any um, that he wanted to have it to himself, but it is not 
are appropriate for the Dhamma and the Buddha who is um, the um, teacher of the Dhamma does people argue about it and refute it but he took that in his stride there were lots of arguments and lots of refutation there wasn't just always smooth sailing in fact he had other teachers trying to give him a bad reputation it never worked because he was getting too famous for their like they didn't like him to be that famous because he was getting far more support than they did so there were lots of um, attempts at discrediting him one time one of the attempts was that a group of um, disciples of another teacher came together and persuaded a lady of ill repute to dress herself up as if she was pregnant you know put a big piece of a block of wood under her sari and stand up in the assembly and say that the Buddha was the one who made her pregnant and uh, she did that in a huge assembly but the Buddha said completely quiet and uh, peaceful there and then as he was sitting there waiting for her to finish the accusations a big gust of wind came and blew her sari away and everybody could see that big block of wood <laughs> so the Buddha said to her you know the truth I know the truth what does it matter to other people so he didn't have any uh, idea of punishing her or punishing the other people had anything to do with it he just said you know the truth I know the truth what does it matter what others know and this is again a story which can show us how it is possible to react the world with its gods and men it's a, it's a phrase which is often used having realized by his own direct knowledge this world with its gods, its maras and its brahmas this generation with its recluses and brahmins rulers and people he makes it known to others the Buddhist cosmology has 32 realms of existence we are the fifth one from the bottom so what can we expect? there are 26 above us but we need not think that we have to wander through every one of them like through a bunch of classes in the school in order to get out at the top the uh, rebirth which we will have or have had go up and down in every which way depending entirely upon the karma that we have made in other words there's never just a straightforward up it's always con contains everything we can look at these 32 realms of existence as 32 kinds of consciousness we do not have to believe that the hell is down there and heaven's up there it doesn't sound reasonable and logical although some people like it whatever they like there are 32 realms of consciousness the human realm of consciousness is the fifth one from the bottom below that is the realm of consciousness of animals below that it's the realm of consciousness of the asuras the asuras are titans they are always fighting they're depicted as black and white there are black ones and white ones and they're constantly fighting with each other they are sort of underworld gods and then there is the realm of the hungry ghost they are depicted usually as um, looking like thick men that children draw with a tiny little throat and a huge belly and because they have such a tiny little throat and such a huge belly they're always hungry they're always wanting something their tummy is never full because they can't get enough through their throats so they are in the realm of constant greed and then below that 
is hell. And we don't have to go far to find it. It's all around us. Minor health, medium health, and big health. And there are books written about them. So, and the animals we can see. And greed we know. So, and fighting we know too. Now, above us are Um, in five. 21 realms which are deva realms becoming more and more subtle devas a consciousness of beauty and delight the lowest one are called the Bhuma devas Bhuma means earth and they are the ones that are sitting in cabbages like a tinton and uh, <laughs> and some people can see them and most people can't and uh, yes and they sit in trees and everywhere that was one of those that were sitting in the tree where the Buddha was sitting under and we since they are the nearest realm to us number six of course we have a sort of connection to them just like we have a connection to animals I mean, people keep pets, people have animals, we like them, some of them we really think are wonderful, and so on. We have a connection because we're close. We're not just close because of anything other than because of the bodies that are there of the animals, but we are close because we're close in consciousness. And if you've ever watched animals carefully, you can see it quite easily, particularly in birds. They're constantly scared. They're always looking around, constantly on the lookout whether somebody's going to take something away from them, their food, their territory. They're not just pretty. We're not just pretty. We've got all sorts of troubles. Fear is a human condition. So we have the devas. We start out with the boomer devas, and they have all sorts of different names, the deva realms, and they are all in the karma loka. Loka is location, realm. Karma is desire, not karma, but karma with a long A. It's desire. The realms of desire. And their desires are, of course, much more subtle than ours, but they still have them. I'm trying to do the mathematics this minute. 21 and 26, there should be only four left. There must be, must be 23 of them, because otherwise it doesn't come out. Because the last four, the Brahma realms, are the highest. And they are, so to say, the God realms. And they're also... Uh, successively more subtle. They are no longer in the desire realm and the vehicle to get there are the jhanas. So if we don't get any insight but only the jhanas and die in one of the higher jhanas, the formless, formless jhanas, we are reborn in the Brahma realms. The Brahma realms, the Buddha said, are also not desirable. I mean, they're better than this one but they're not desirable. First of all, they're also impermanent but they last an awful long time. And because they last so long, and because the beings that are reborn there are very purified and have the jhanas as their vehicle and have the four Brahma Viharas, the four great emotions, superior, supreme emotions, as their inner being, they think of themselves as being perfect, as being omniscient, as being almighty, as um, being in charge and in reality they're also impermanent so it's another myth that we have established and the um, the, the uh, time span of their existence is so immense that they think they're eternal 
But the Buddha said, no, everything's impermanent, that too. There's only one thing that's not impermanent, and that's Nibbana. So also he declared that it wasn't desirable to get reborn in those realms. Although it is, of course, much uh, more advantageous than being in the human realm. But, on the other hand, as we have just heard, the Buddha was born in the human realm and became enlightened here. So it, he has said that this is the best realm for enlightenment because we have enough dukkha to get us going to a meditation retreat. And we have enough sukha in between so that we don't get completely depressed by it. <laughs> and that is the way, the middle way, the way to practice so that we can continue to practice. The Deva realms have not enough dukkha. Everything is quite wonderful there. It's sort of this idea of paradise. Everything is just beautiful. So they don't have enough dukkha, so they don't practice. Now, not all of them, some do, but the majority doesn't. It is also said that when the Buddha gave a discourse, 80 million devas came to listen because they did want to practice. But of course, that's only a minority. So that's the, the world that he knows all about, the 32 realms. Now, a householder or a householder's son or one born into some good family, hears the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he gains, gains faith in the Tathagata and doubt with such faith he reflects. The household life is crowded, a path of dust going forth is like the open air. It's not easy for one dwelling at home to lead the perfectly complete perfectly purified holy life, bright as a polished conch. Let, then shave, let me then shave off my hair and beard, put on saffron robes, go forth from the household life into homelessness. This is all part of the third fruit. So if one has heard the Dhamma, the teaching, and gains faith, that will be the first step, the gaining faith is the first step that leads to the joy of the path. In the transcendental dependent arising, it starts out with knowing our own dukkha. Of course, many people don't. They distract themselves so efficiently, and we can do that because of our wonderful technology. They distract themselves so well that they do not really get in touch with the constantly arising dukkha. And as I have already mentioned at other times, this, and others use their dukkha to blame somebody, blame others or blame themselves. It's only when we see dukkha as a fact of existence, an unsupported, it's an um, undeniable fact <coughs> that we can actually make up our minds to do something about it. So the transcendental dependent rising starts out with our own understanding that dukkha is, period. It's not caused by somebody, it's not because things didn't work well, it's not because we're stupid, it's not because somebody doesn't mean well towards us. It's not because the, the government is stupid. Nothing like it. Dukkha is, period. That's how it starts, the understanding of the spiritual life. And that dukkha is nothing personal. It's universal. Because when we see it as universal, it has far less sting. It doesn't hurt. Everybody's got it. And the next thing is to have the good karma to hear the true Dhamma. Not many people have that good karma. And even in the Buddha's time, it was considered to be very good karma to be able to hear the true Dhamma. And here it is. <laughs> I'll get to it. <laughs>
Sound here. We have a map here. <laughs> Now, obviously, when we first hear the Dhamma, we cannot agree to it out of personal experience. It's impossible. We haven't done it yet. But we must have enough intelligence to understand what's true. And it takes that kind of surrender that comes from loving that we can arouse Confidence, faith, and devotion. These are prerequisites for practice. They don't come only from practice. With practice, of course, they come as a matter of course. But they are prerequisites. Surrender, confidence, and devotion. If we don't have it, we're sampling it. And always looking for something a little easier. We haven't seen the true side. That we haven't experienced it doesn't matter. So here it said, having heard the Dhamma, he gains faith. Now faith is not supposed to be blind faith. It's coupled with enough wisdom to understand what's true and what isn't. And with that gaining of faith, joy arises in the heart joy of knowing here's a path which can lead me out of all dukkha. Now that joy is another prerequisite for meditation, for practicing the spiritual life, for practicing the holy life. Without joy, the thing just doesn't work. It's tedious, it's boring, it's uh, difficult, it's depressing, it's all sorts of things. It has to have joy in it. And the joy comes from our own intelligence to know here is a way. Dukkha is everywhere. Here is a way to get out. Usually people are looking for loopholes. This one doesn't leave any loopholes. None. We either do it or we don't. Naturally we do it gradually. But the loopholes are not there. So, if we're looking for the loopholes of it's quite nice to practice when I have free time or I'll practice on Sundays or I'll, uh, I'll practice when I've got nothing else to do or after I have uh, made my arrangements with uh, whatever I want to get in this life, that doesn't work. It has to come first. Because when it comes first, everything else will be added on. That's the way it always has worked and always will work. Unfortunately, this whole pathway, the whole spiritual teaching, is in the West very often being taught as just another way of getting oneself together. But that's not what it means at all. It's a total spiritual practice where the material life is of course lived. We can't help it. We've got a body. We've got to live the material life. But it is lived under the auspices of spirituality. We've got to turn that around and see whether that's what we really want to do. So he gains faith, huh? and then he reflects that he would like to have a, um, the spiritual life as his um, priority. And after he has decided that, made a decision, and here again I'd like to harp once more upon making decisions. If we want to make a meal, we've got to decide what ingredients to use. We can't just take everything that's lying in the kitchen, throw it in a pot. There has to be some decision made. And with that decision, there has to be a plan. I want to make a certain dish, so I'll put in certain ingredients. That same kind of decision has to be made in meditation in the spiritual life. What do I want to do? What are the ingredients? 
the Buddha is the show of the way I'm trying to explain the ingredients over and over again and again that's all there has to be decision making it is not something that will happen we have to make it happen just like cooking dinner we have to make it happen otherwise it doesn't happen so then he has decided this and then after some time he abandons his accumulation of wealth be it large or small circle of relatives large or small shaves off hair and beard and puts on saffron robes and goes forth from the household life into the homelessness and when he has thus gone forth he lives restrained by the restraint of the patimoka patimoka are the rules of conduct for monks and nuns possessed of proper behavior and resort having taken up the rules of training he trains himself in them seeing danger in the slightest fault now this is also very important and what I'm trying to also uh, depict for you is that every bit of the Buddha's words is important there's always meaning behind the sentences it's not just watch your breath or do the jhanas or change your unwholesome thoughts or try to get a little bit more loving these are of course methods and there will be methods in this sutta also but every bit of this is important and here is a sentence where it says seeing danger in the slightest fault. This is something that a long time practitioner or anyone who takes it seriously eventually comes to. There is danger in the slightest fault. Now that doesn't mean that a person who sees that will never have any faults or make, do anything wrong, but they see the danger and are much more careful. This is what I mentioned when I talked about karma, being careful always remembering it's very unfortunate when we make bad karma we suffer from it small bad karma we suffer little big bad karma we suffer a great deal there's no way out we have whatever accumulation of karma we have that of course also has something to do with our suffering but if we really would like to diminish our suffering we also need to remember that there is danger in everything when we are have negativity it's dangerous for us not for other people danger in the life he comes to be endowed with wholesome bodily and verbal action his livelihood is purified he's possessed of moral discipline he guards the doors of his sense faculties is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension and is content and we finally got to the mindfulness I will explain something about mindfulness because I want you to practice it methods practice I will talk about more probably tomorrow I'll come back to that paragraph more tomorrow because there are some other things in it but first the mindfulness which needs to be practiced watching the breath is called anapanasati sati is mindfulness s-a-t-i which means mindfulness of in-breath out-breath but if we only practice that we are never going to be successful with the meditation nor will there ever be any change in our whole inner being mindfulness is not something that is just left on this pillow when we get up and get out the door mindfulness is a mental formation which is our greatest support system in daily life and whether you are now um, going home or whether you are here mindfulness outside of the meditation practice which means the first aspect of mindfulness is kaya nupasana kaya is k-a-y-a which means body now when we watch the breath that is kaya nupasana that is one aspect of body 
when we do walking meditation, that is kaya nupasna, that is one aspect of body. But this body has many, many movements during a day. And the Buddha said, the one who is not mindful of his body will not experience the deathless. The deathless means nibbana, freedom. We can call it freedom because that's what it is. And it's a much more meaningful word for us. The, uh, because it's a word that has a, has a charge behind it. So um, I will call it freedom. Now, watching the body is of primary importance. And here in a retreat situation, it's much easier than out in the world. Out in the world, there are many things that come at us where we need to react quickly. Here, we don't have to react quickly. We can react slowly. So, we have time to watch what this body is doing. When the body is getting up from the seat, when it's walking to the door, opening the door, putting on shoes, going to the dining room, sitting down, eating, getting up, washing dishes, going to one's room, going to bed, waking up in the morning. The first thing that a person who's really mindful becomes aware of when we wake up in the morning is opening the eyes. Try that tomorrow morning. And if you missed it, close them again and start again. That's the first thing that happens, that has a bodily action. Now, the bodily actions are so manifold, I cannot possibly enumerate them all. Getting dressed, getting undressed, going to the toilet, washing, combing hair, innumerable bodily actions. Each one is a matter of bare attention, which is mindfulness. Mindfulness is bare attention, non-judgmental, just being there. Thich Nhat Hanh has coined the expression, washing dishes while washing dishes. Maybe our dishwashers can try that out tomorrow. Are they washing dishes while washing dishes? or making plans, or hoping for something more interesting, or what are they doing while washing dishes? Washing dishes while washing dishes. The Buddha said, mindfulness is the one way for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of pain, grief, and lamentation, for the final elimination of all dukkha, for entering the noble path, for realizing Nibbana, now, if that is so, it behooves us to at least give it a try. All the time is the right time. Now, obviously, with the body movement, thoughts and emotions also arise in our daily lives. And sometimes it's not appropriate to watch the body movement. Sometimes it's appropriate to watch something else. So we can watch our feelings, our emotions. We can watch our thought processes. The kind of mood which has arisen with the thinking and then we can become aware of the content of the thought. Now the content of the thought I would like to elaborate on at another time because it is very, very clearly laid out in the Sutta on mindfulness in very great detail. But at this point, it's sufficient to say is the thought wholesome or unwholesome? The thinking process as such can sometimes be a necessary point of mindfulness. But the body should take pride of place. 
There are so many things that happen with the body in the day. Now the purification takes place because when we're mindful, we can't be negative. We can't be worried, we can't be fearful, we can't be distracted, we can't do anything other with the mind than being mindful. What could be better than that? Our mind quietens down, calms down, comes together, solidifies, and is able to meditate. If we leave the mindfulness on the pillow and walk out and do anything with the mind that we wish, and then come back in here and want to meditate, what do we expect? We have the one mind that is supposed to be totally one-pointed on the pillow and then thinks anything it wants when it goes outside. It can't work, can it? Life becomes very difficult without mindfulness. Most people use mindfulness just for survival. Not to get run over by a car, not to cut their fingers when they peel potatoes, to dial the right number on the telephone, to make a living. Survival is a useless enterprise. Nobody makes it. It's just a secondary endeavor. Our primary endeavor should our, be our spiritual growth. Mindfulness needs to be used as a spiritual faculty, which it is. It is one, or the primary one, the first one, not primary, the first one of the five spiritual faculties. And when we actually become mindful, it becomes the first one of the five spiritual powers. They're exactly the same. And if we use it as a spiritual faculty, that means we are staying within ourselves. We don't worry about what goes on out there. We stay with ourselves. We are aware of what this body is doing. We're aware of what this mind is doing. Pride of place for the body. Now, when we become mindful, and I'd like you to do as much of that as you can possibly bring to bear in every moment while you're here. And if we practice mindfulness of the body, we immediately have the insight into the very first step of the inside path, namely that mind and body are two. The mind's in charge and the body follows suit. Sometimes it can't. When it's old or feeble or sick, it can't do what the mind says, but mostly we tell it only that which it can do, because we are aware of our limitations. So we need to watch that too, that the mind has the intention and the body follows through on it. The body can't get up if the mind doesn't say, get up. Now, we don't notice that in daily life. It's such a fundamental truism that it doesn't seem to bear explanation, and yet it's the first step into insight. So when we are mindful of the body, that too comes to the fore that we see that. Clear comprehension is mentioned here also, so I will mention that too, because it is very important, and it is part of practice. Clear comprehension has four parts. The first one is, what is the purpose of what I'm now thinking, saying, or doing? These are our three doors. Think, say, do. That's all we can. We've got nothing else. So, with those three doors, whichever one is appropriate, what's the purpose? What's my purpose? Now, maybe we can see that the purpose is useful. So, okay, we go ahead. But maybe we can already at that point see that there is no purpose. Or, maybe we can even see, if we're smart enough, that the purpose is ego support, ego assertion. 
And if we can see that, we're much better off to refrain from whatever it is that we want to do because every ego assertion is usually met with the ego assertion of somebody else and the two clash together. So that's where we get all our um, interpersonal difficulties from. So if we can actually watch that and see the purpose, we might be able to refrain or we see it's a good purpose. The next step is, what am I, what I am employing, are these the most skillful means? Skillful means is also a matter of practice. All skills can be learned. So whatever it is we want to say, do, are we using skillful means? The same applies to our thought system. Is it skillful what I'm thinking? And if it isn't, refrain. And the third step is, are means and purpose within the Dhamma? Is it within the precepts and within the supreme emotions? In other words, is it something that has love, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity in it, generosity, helpfulness? Does it comply with the five precepts of not killing, not stealing, no sexual misconduct, not lying, no alcohol or drugs? Or is it, does anything speak against that? There is no end that justifies the means. The means and the end both have to be within the Dhamma. Is it for truth or is it for self-concern? Am I doing it or thinking it for truth, to find truth, or is it something else? And then, after having decided that it is a good purpose, that what I'm doing are the most skillful means, that the whole thing is within the Dhamma, then going ahead, going ahead with it. And then at the end, ascertaining whether the purpose has actually, the object has actually been obtained. And if not, why not? What went wrong? Now there are other aspects of clear comprehension which I will explain at another time in more detail when we get to it. Something that is even more detailed and in more, even more meditative. But these are the four which can be used in everyday life. Purpose, skillful means, Dhamma, have I achieved the purpose? And if not, why not? What went wrong? What are the bad means that I used? What are the unskillful means that I used? Or what was it? Now, it does not have any uh, usefulness to find the lack of result in others. Others will have to do their own practice. One always has to find it in oneself. And if one can't find it, one has to try another time. It doesn't matter. We've got all the lifetimes in the world. What we don't do this time, we'll have to do next time. It doesn't really matter. If the urgency isn't there, then it will just take longer. That's all. It doesn't matter really because of the fact that it's all a matter of flowing with the natural process of constant change. So the reason I was very keen to get to mindfulness explanation was because I'd like you to practice it. I'd like you to remember it under as many circumstances as you can to use the body as your primary object of attention. It's movements. It's actions. At the same time seeing how the mind gives the orders. Also seeing how the body movements, every one of them, is totally impermanent and has to be. Otherwise, we can't accomplish a thing. If our walking not every movement were not impermanent and changed every time 
we wouldn't ever walk anywhere. We'd be stationary for the rest of our lives. Most uncomfortable, I would think. So every movement is impermanent. So if we can see the first step of mind giving orders, the second step, the arising of it all and the ceasing of it all, we may also become aware of the autonomous body actions like heart, blood, breath, outside of meditation and see that too arising and ceasing. Whatever it is, the body is the primary object because of the fact that it's easy to see, we can see it, it's easy to touch, and we identify with it, and it's constantly doing something which is not difficult to become aware of. The mind can't be seen, it can't be touched, we do identify with it, and it's also constantly doing something, but half of it at least falls by the wayside. We don't even notice it. With a body that's not so easy to uh, uh, not notice it. We are more likely to notice the body. If we watch the body movements, our efficiency is much improved and the efficiency which we have for everything we do leaves us more energy, more time to go deeper to use more of that into our meditation. So, mindfulness and clear comprehension. But I will again, at another point here in the Sutta, come back to clear comprehension because there's another, there's more interesting facts about it also. And also mindfulness will be mentioned again at another point. The Buddha used that sentence the one way, ekayana, only on mindfulness. So you can see how important it is. There's no other sentence by the Buddha which says the one way, only on mindfulness. Mindfulness is our way to meditation. Mindfulness is our way to the deathless. Enough? Any questions? Comments, commentaries, sub commentaries. Mm-hmm. I have a question. Now, you say something about the difference between the observing and the decision making. The observer. The observer. Yes. There's also decision making that is directing the mind to mm-hmm. um, hold that goes. That, that comes first. The decision making comes first. Then comes the observer, observing what's going on. What, what is what is decision Mental formation. Mental observer is also mental formation. Just another aspect. Mindfulness is mental formation. The observer is the one who knows what's going on. The one, the the decision making is the aspect of making a determination. I mean, in order to come here, one has to make a decision, no? One can't just observe oneself getting in the car and going, one's got to make a decision first, no? You've got to make a decision to come to this place. So volition is also... That's the same. Volition and decision, intention, that's all the same. Motivation. That all goes under that. Volition is that too. Yes. Question, excuse me, the question I have is a little fanciful. When the next Buddha comes, if I had his own truth, he can't rely on what this Buddha has to mm-hmm. Yes. He has to find the same Four Noble Truths and Noble Eightfold Path again, so it is said. Um, I have no personal experience of that. <laughs> Uh, he has to find that again, yes, and he does, otherwise he won't be the Buddha. And in other words, but the Buddha has, has discovered, has been known before, and he has to find it out himself. 
been known before and got lost. It gets lost. It gets completely lost because people don't practice. Mm -hmm. And we are on a, on a very um, a definite downward slide. We're just holding it together now for a hundred years and then the whole thing is going to go downward again. <laughs> hmm? Anything else? Yes. Um, the Devo realms and the Hell realms and the Rama realms, um, I've heard different teachers' opinions on whether those are to be taken allegorically as the part of us. Um, and I've heard some teachers say that the Buddha spoke of these things uh, unequivocally as facts, not um, well, he spoke about it as a cosmology, but one mustn't forget that he was Indian and he was teaching Indians, and uh, Indians think a little differently from the Westerner. Um, so he spoke about it as fact. But they are definitely states of consciousness. They have to be. Because in order to be a Deva or a Brahman or in order to be uh, in the hell, you have to have a state of consciousness that fits that realm. You can't have a consciousness of a Deva and live in hell. That's impossible. So uh, these are states of consciousness. And whether you think that they are a actual places to be found, well, that's up to you, whatever you like. That's, you know, they are definitely states of consciousness, there's no doubt about that. And these states of consciousness, quite a number of them, we can experience now, while we're in this body, because we have experienced, maybe sometimes, the state of consciousness of complete love, which is one of the Brahma Viharas, which is one of the consciousnesses that are available to the four highest realms, we have probably experienced absolute, total, awful hate, which is a hell realm. We maybe have been greedy like animals. Anything you can think of. Only your own imagination gives it any uh, limit. But there are certainly states of consciousness, no doubt about it. Whatever else you like to do with it, it's up to you. Bingo. Anything else? Yes? I don't know if this is my hearing or not, but is there Brahma Vihara and Brahma Vihara? Brahma. Brahma Vihara. So that's one. That's the same thing, yeah. Maybe I pronounced it wrong. For them. Maybe I pronounced it differently or something. Brahma Vihara, I see, because the Brahmas are the gods, and Vihara is a place to live. So actually, the translation for Brahma Vihara means the abode of the gods, the f and they're called in the dictionary the four divine abidings. But I mean, these are also unusual words that we don't really uh, get uh, taken with them. I mean, they don't they don't seem to do anything. You know, they're just out there somewhere. So they are the four supreme and pure emotions but they are called those four Brahma-viharas. And the four highest states of um, the four highest realms are the Brahma realms, and that's where those four emotions are constantly practiced. So we can get a little taste of it, what it's like, if we have uh, that kind of loving feeling inside and with nothing else that's disturbing it, and maybe have the jhanas, so we have an idea. They're always like that. But that's not enlightenment. That's just Brahma realms. Is that clear? Yes. One of those Davids who are living in the higher, higher realms, what do they do over there? They're practically perfect. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about what they do, but there are some devas that actually do practice meditation and practice to become more, well, the devas are by no means perfect. They just have a lovely life because they've been very, very kind and good, good 
beings. No, that's in the Brahma realm. I don't know what they do. Who knows? <laughs> Supposedly, they're supposed to help us. But that's absolutely impossible because, first of all, they don't seem to be doing a good job of it. And, 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 and secondly, they're much too far removed. Their, their consciousness is too far removed from ours. It's uh, very rarely that they could connect to a consciousness which is in a human body. It, it's possible, but usually it's not. And they're not certainly not doing a great job of helping. No, we're not so bad off being here. This is the best realm for enlightenment. If that's what we're using this realm for, we're doing a good job. But if we're using it as an amusement park, we're doing it not a very good job. Because we're always going to fall down on it again. We have a choice. Of course, certainly. And the choices are, are being made every day. Yes. Now imagine you have a beautiful sun shining in your heart, which gives it warmth and light. <coughs> which you feel beloved at ease well cared for experience that warmth and that light in your heart surrounded by love and care and ease. Let the sun in your heart shine on the person nearest you in this room. Fill him or her with the warmth and light from your heart, bringing love and care and well-being to that person. Let the sun from your heart shine on everybody here so that everybody can experience the warmth and the light that comes from your heart, feeling beloved and cared for.
Let the sun from your heart shine on all the people who are in this place. Giving them the warmth and the love that your heart contains. let the sun from your heart shine on those people who are close to you those you might live with who are dear to you feel the warmth and the love coming from your heart and filling their hearts. Think of your friends, let the sun in your heart shine on them, bringing them your friendship, your warmth, your care, letting them feel your close connection. Think of all the people who are part of your life, every day or now and then. Let the sun in your heart shine on all of them, spreading its rays of warmth and life and love. Think of anyone whom you find difficult, 
let the sun in your heart shine on that person too. The sun shines on everyone, bringing warmth, bringing care, bringing life, bringing love. Let that person receive it too.